your on your call. Akash, let's start. Prime Minister Muscat, Prime Minister May, Secretary General, ladies and gentlemen. Having on so many occasions been welcomed to opening ceremonies around the Commonwealth, it is a pleasure this time to welcome you to my own home. Here at Buckingham Palace in 1949, my father met the heads of government when they ratified the London Declaration, which created the Commonwealth as we know it today, then comprising just eight nations. Who then, or in 1952, when I became head of the Commonwealth, would have guessed that a gathering of its member states would one day number 53, or that it would comprise 2.4 billion people? Put simply, we are one of the world's great convening powers, a global association of volunteers who believe in the tangible benefits that flow from exchanging ideas and experiences and respecting each other's point of view. And we seem to be growing stronger year by year. The advantages are plain to see an increasing emphasis on trade between our countries is helping us all to discover exciting new ways of doing business. And imaginative initiatives have shown how together we can bring about change on a global scale. The Commonwealth Canopy has emphasized our interdependence, while the Commonwealth Blue Charter promises to do the same in protecting our shared ocean resources. The Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Trust is providing life-changing eye treatment to many thousands through the generosity and cooperation of the nations represented here today. My family and I have been heartened by these and many other programs in which we are proud to play a part. I'm glad to see that young people connecting through technology are becoming ever more involved. When I meet the young leaders of this century, I remember my own lifelong commitment made in South Africa in 1947 at the age of 21. As another birthday approaches this week, I'm reminded of the extraordinary journey we have been on and how much good has been achieved. It remains a great pleasure and honor to serve you as head of the Commonwealth and to observe with pride and satisfaction that this is a flourishing network. It is my sincere wish that the Commonwealth will continue to offer stability and continuity for future generations and will decide that one day the Prince of Wales should carry on the important work started by my father in 1949. By continuing to treasure and reinvigorate our associations and activities, I believe we will secure a safer, more prosperous and sustainable world for those who follow us. A world where the Commonwealth's generosity of spirit can bring its gentle touch of healing and hope to all. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II inaugurating the Commonwealth Heads of Government in London in 2018. Good evening to each one of you. My name is Colin Saldana and it is my pleasure 
as chair of the Royal Commonwealth Society and behalf of members of council to welcome you to the second lecture in the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. The topic for today's virtual event is the Queen, a champion of the Commonwealth. The modern Commonwealth of Nations was born in 1949 in London when the London Declaration confirmed that republics and other countries associated with the crown could be part of the Commonwealth. King George VI was the first head of the Commonwealth and upon his demise was succeeded by Queen Elizabeth II. Unlike other international organizations, this organization is a family organization. It is less marked by contractual arrangements and more by an understanding of common values, traditions and aspirations as in any family. The Commonwealth of Nations has become possible because of their natural affinity associated with a shared past, a common language, common governance structure, and the rule of law. The organization, like any family, has had its ups and downs, its trials, its challenges, and indeed its successes. Her Majesty has proved that pivotal role as head of the Commonwealth and has used her soft power of engagement to bring stability and success. A case in point was Her Majesty's role behind the scenes in bringing apartheid to an end and ensuring South Africa's rightful role in the Commonwealth. Today, we are going to engage in a forum and discussion about a champion, Her Majesty the Queen, who has led this unique organization that you and I call the Commonwealth. This earlier video that we saw was about Her Majesty engaging with today's Commonwealth leadership. Let us take a peek into the archives and see how far back we can go to see Her Majesty meeting with and consulting with prime ministers of years gone by. This was in 1952 in Buckingham Palace when Her Majesty welcomed a few of her confidants. You see here in the picture on, the, on her right, Sir Winston Churchill on her left, Prime Minister Laurent Fra of Canada, the Prime Ministers of India, Pakistan, Australia. This was in 1952. We then move on to the 3rd of December, 1953, once again with her senior members of the Commonwealth, Prime Minister Churchill is still there. We have uh, Prime Ministers of Australia, Canada, Sri Lanka as well in the picture. Next. This picture was taken out in 1963 when we have John Diefenbaker, the Prime Minister of Canada, Harold Macmillan, Prime Minister of the UK, President uh, uh, Ayub Khan from Pakistan, and we have uh, the Indian Prime Minister present as well. Next. This takes us to 1975 in Jamaica on the Royal Yacht Britannica. We see Prime Minister Trudeau standing second from the right on the far end. We have Prime Minister Gandhi out there from India, Bandara Naiki from Sri Lanka, and other member heads of state on the Royal Br Yacht Britannia. And finally, we have the picture at Buckingham Palace. Uh, this is colored compared to the black and white we saw initially. And this is uh, the last one that was held in 2018, as you all know, that was scheduled to have one in 2020 in Rwanda. That has, was postponed until this year when it will be held in June in Rwanda. A majesty there with the prime ministers, including Prime Minister Trudeau and Prime Minister Muscat of um, Malta. Now, let me take you to another aspect of Her Majesty. Her Majesty endeavors 
to speak directly, not only to the heads of government, but she speaks directly to the citizens of the Commonwealth in good times and in bad, confirming that she listens and relates to the joys and concerns of the citizens of the Commonwealth. Her Christmas message is often well received and is now a family tradition in many homes. I'm going to share with you Her Majesty's words of comfort and support to the citizens of the Commonwealth during the pandemic. Over the coming week, as we celebrate the friendship, spirit of unity, and achievements of the Commonwealth, we have an opportunity to reflect on a time like no other. Whilst experiences of the last year have been different across the Commonwealth, stir examples of courage, commitment, and selfless dedication to duty have been demonstrated in every Commonwealth nation and territory, notably by those working on the front line who have been delivering health care and other public services in their communities. We have also taken encouragement from remarkable advances in developing new vaccines and treatments. The testing times experienced by so many have led to a deeper appreciation of the mutual support and spiritual sustenance we enjoy by being connected to others. The need to maintain greater physical distance or to live and work largely in isolation has, for many people across the Commonwealth, been an unusual experience. In our everyday lives, we have had to become more accustomed to connecting and communicating via innovative technology, which has been new to some of us, with conversations and communal gatherings, including Commonwealth meetings, conducted online, enabling people to stay in touch with friends, family, colleagues and counterparts who they have not been able to meet in person. Increasingly, we have found ourselves able to enjoy such communication, as it offers an immediacy that transcends boundaries or division, helping any sense of distance to disappear. We have all continued to appreciate the support, breadth of experiences and knowledge that working together brings. And I hope we shall maintain this renewed sense of closeness and community. Looking forward, relationships with others across the Commonwealth will remain important as we strive to deliver a common future that is sustainable and more secure, so that the nations and neighbourhoods in which we live, wherever they are located, become healthier and happier places for us all. Ladies and gentlemen, what this really proves is to show the empathy, the concern that Her Majesty has for her citizens, a unique quality, a quality that has translated in return a source of respect and admiration for Her Majesty. We decided to open the history books and pick a few sincere and genuine quotes from Her Majesty to her people. The Queen speaks from her heart to the Commonwealth. We're familiar with the first quote that was said in South Africa. I declare before, I quote, I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. On yet another occasion, Her Majesty stated, I cannot lead you into battle. I do not give you laws or administer justice but I can do something else. I can give my heart and my devotion to these old islands and to all the people of our brotherhood of nations. Her Majesty on yet another occasion states, I have in sincerity pledged myself to your service as so many of you have pledged to mine. Throughout all my life and all my heart, I shall strive to be worthy of your trust.
And this, ladies and gentlemen, is very poignant. We can rightly celebrate the, the Majesty states. We can rightly celebrate the fact that the founding members vision of the future has become a reality. The Commonwealth has evolved out of all recognition from its beginning. It has helped to give birth to modern nations and the eight original countries have become 53. We now are home to nearly 2 billion people, a third of the world's population. Across continents and oceans, we have come to represent all the rich diversity of humankind. Yet, despite its size and scale, the Commonwealth to me has been sustained during all this change by the opportunity of our mutual values and goals, our beliefs in freedom, democracy, and human rights. Development and prosperity mean as much today as it did more than half a century ago, end of quote. Ladies and gentlemen, we talked about values, we've talked about traditions, and all of this was embodied in what we now refer to as the Commonwealth Charter. On March 11th, 2013 in London, England, Her Majesty signed the Commonwealth Charter. The Commonwealth Charter is a document of the values and aspirations which unite the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth Charter expresses the commitment of member states to the development of free and democratic societies and the promotion of peace and prosperity to improve the lives of all the people of the Commonwealth. The Charter also acknowledges the role of civil society in supporting the goals and values of the Commonwealth. Please join me in viewing Her Majesty signing the document and her speech at the event. I am delighted to join you for Commonwealth Day. I'm grateful to you, Mr. Secretary General, for your kind and generous sentiments and for your thoughtful words about the link between the Crown and the Commonwealth and its enduring value. In the 12 months since we last gathered here, I have been especially touched by the messages of support and good wishes from around the Commonwealth and by the warmth of the reception given to members of my family as they represented me during the celebrations of the Diamond Jubilee. Throughout the ages, charters have been seen as special documents designed with care to stand the test of time. The charter I will sign today on behalf of you all represents a significant milestone as the Commonwealth continues its journey of development and renewal. We now have, for the first time, a single document that captures the core values and aspirations of the Commonwealth and all its members. It will light the path of all those involved in the work of the Commonwealth and of those who follow in our footsteps. I hope the carefully chosen words of the Charter will reinvigorate efforts already begun to make the Commonwealth fit and agile for the years ahead, so that it can apply its global wisdom in the hopes and needs of this and future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, 
I hope that I have presented the framework on which we will base the talk, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, a champion of the Commonwealth. Indeed she is. And we have a unique and distinguished speaker today who has agreed to join us. I'm referring to none other than the Honorable Hugh Siegel. In earlier this evening when we spoke, he advised me to make his introduction brief. And so I've had to cut it by half. Mr. Siegel was, has served as chief of staff to a prime minister and was part of the negotiating team for both the Charlottetown Accord in 1991 and the repatriation of the Constitution and Charter of Rights and Freedom in 1982-83. In 2003, he was made a member of the Order of Canada. He also served as a member of the nine-person Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group, which proposed reform around democracy, rule of law, human rights, gender equity, judicial independence, and modernization of Commonwealth of the Commonwealth. He presented this with his colleagues at the Commonwealth Heads of Government in Perth in 2011. Subsequently, he was Canada's special envoy to the Commonwealth on these issues. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome the Honorable Hugh Siegel. Colin, um, friends, it is a tremendous privilege to be here with the Royal Commonwealth Society of Canada and friends um, beyond, uh, beyond the seas to celebrate not only um, the Platinum Jubilee, but to contribute to the reflections that the Commonwealth Society has arranged in their speaking speaker series from very distinguished and thoughtful people. Um, I will talk about the Commonwealth from the perspective of my hands-on involvement with it um, over my life, over the experience of the Commonwealth, and most importantly, the role of Her Majesty as its constant champion and multi-decade head, rather than go through a simple recital of the well-known history of Her Majesty's remarkable and inspired titular and influential leadership of our Commonwealth. I thought that sharing my personal hands-on experiences would be a unique contribution that might add a bit of personal texture to this Platinum Jubilee commemoration. Um, as we are celebrating in a week's time, Commonwealth Day 2022, in the early days of what may well be an all-out Russian war on Europe, with risks that would, be un would have been unfathomable before the 21st of February, I would like to underline how central Her Majesty has been to the idea of freedom and democracy to millions worldwide since the Second World War, two concepts which are fundamental to the Commonwealth's goals, purposes, and direction for its entire history. Soon after President Obama was elected for the first time in 2008, Her Majesty hosted an elegant state dinner in his honor at Buckingham Palace. And among the many distinguished guests from the diplomatic, artistic, business, political worlds of London, Her Majesty had also invited some American guests in honor of her guest of honor, President Obama, and one of whom was the immensely talented and wonderfully human and humane actor, Tom Hanks. After returning from London, Mr. Hanks was a guest on the then ubiquitous David Letterman late night talk show. In his opening welcome to Mr. Hanks, Letterman had, made, had some fun at Mr. Hanks' expense, referencing the state dinner for President Obama, Buckingham Palace, Her Majesty's role as host. His intimation was that the evening must have been boring, stuffy, and not very compelling. Tom Hanks stopped Letterman cold in his tracks. Hanks asked Letterman directly, 
Dave, uh, what were you doing during World War II? Well, Dave Letterman had no response because he was only born in 1947. Hanks then informed Letterman that Her Majesty trained as a member of the Territorial Auxiliary Army in the armed forces and served in the motor pool during the German Blitz of London and was, in his view, the brightest and most cool personality he had ever met. This evoked wild applause in the Ed Sullivan Theater on national television and saw Letterman quickly scamper to another topic. That the commitment to freedom and democracy goes all the way back to her teenage years during World War II is really, really important because it speaks to part of her undying commitment to the idea of the Commonwealth as a freely associated group of independent countries who work together to defend those values. Now, the idea of Her Majesty and the Commonwealth first came into my awareness when I was 10 years old in grade five at a parochial school in Montreal. The explicit relevance of that idea to the politics and parliamentary democracy of Canada became deeply apparent to me during my time as Associate Cabinet Secretary for Federal Provincial Relations in Ontario and as Chief of Staff for the Prime Minister of Canada. The third vantage point was the period of my having served as the Government of Canada's Special Envoy to the Commonwealth for Human Rights and Rule of Law. And this followed, as Colin had suggested, my time as the Canadian member of the Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group charged with bringing in coherent recommendations on modernizing and humanizing the Commonwealth as a humanitarian, cooperative and common values driven voluntary international organization, not bound by treaties, economic, trade or defense, but by common and shared values and purposes. This was in the middle years of the last decade and it was a period that allowed me to meet Her Majesty on several occasions and to witness firsthand the depth of her influence and leadership as the head of the Commonwealth. My perspective on Her Majesty's role over this long time period obviously evolved. My appreciation of her central salience to the idea and survival of the Commonwealth not only deepened, but also became more layered in its key elements. Her interactions and multiple state and working visits to Canada, of course, counted a great deal. At the front of my grade five classroom in Montreal, hanging over the blackboard, was a large map of the world with all the pink colored countries representing what was then referred to as the British Commonwealth of Nations. And above the map was a photograph of Her Majesty and Prince Philip. Along the rest of the high wall surface were sketches of great figures from the Old Testament, Moses, Joshua, Aaron, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Isaiah, etc. And I recall asking my grade five teacher why the photo of the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh were a little higher than these much revered holy figures from the Bible. I remember her reply to this day. Young man, it is because of Her Majesty and the role of the crown and the fact that we are all equal under the law, which is embodied by the crown, that you and I have the right to worship in our own way and live in freedom in Canada. And that same rule applies to all the pink spots on the map that are part of the British Commonwealth. And she added, wagging her finger at me, don't you ever forget it. However mildly overstated her view of history may have been, I have never forgotten it. During the constitutional work of Premier Davis, along with Premier Hatfield of New Brunswick, among the premiers supporting Prime Minister Trudeau in the early 1980s, and his package of repatriating the constitution from Westminster and inserting a charter of the crown as a central element, defining the role and reach of parliament with our constitution, 
was part of the debates engaged and led to agreements that were finally reached. The actual definition, of course, of parliament in Canada, as many will know, encompasses three pieces, the House of Commons, the Senate, and the Crown. All are equal parts of our parliamentary democracy. And when you say the Crown in Canada, you mean, of course, Elizabeth II. At one of the various impasses during the 82-83 discussions, when there was a break in round table talks between the premiers and the prime minister to see if private negotiations might find a way magically through the log jam, it was suggested by the prime minister that failing a consensus, he might have to go to London on his own to seek support from Mrs. Thatcher and the Queen for his government's constitutional package and do so without broad provincial support. In the Ontario delegation and some others, further private discussions had to ensue. And in fact, they did produce the famous notwithstanding formula that made the Charter of Rights possible. An example of the amazing influence on affairs among and within Commonwealth countries that has typified Elizabeth II's reign to date is her influence that has been inspiring and stabilizing at the same time. When Her Majesty came to Canada in April of 1982 on a very rainy day on Parliament Hill to sign the new constitution that was not just a symbolic presence of our sovereign, but it was her approval of the work that had been done by her provinces and her federal government in the Dominion of Canada. Her many Commonwealth Day messages have been consistent in their embrace of the power of diversity, and voluntary cooperation between so many countries with populations of such diverse racial, cultural, linguistic, histories and realities. From the very beginning, Queen Elizabeth sought to clarify and underline the difference between the new Commonwealth and the British Empire from which it sprung. In her now famous foundational Christmas Day message from New Zealand in 1953, Her Majesty made the point with both clarity and precision, and I quote, the Commonwealth bears no resemblance to the empires of the past. It is an entirely new conception built on the highest qualities of the spirit of friendship, loyalty, the desire for freedom and peace. That the role of the Commonwealth has been a positive force for these outcomes during her reign speaks remarkably to her leadership. One need only attend a Commonwealth Heads of Government conference to see the enthusiasm and affection with which a diverse range of more than 50 heads of government gather an expectation of their private audience with Her Majesty. They each want not only a moment to exchange good wishes and reflections, and of course, have a photo taken to be used at home for their home audiences, but are also confident with how much of the affairs of their own country, Her Majesty will be completely conversant. When I had the privilege of meeting Her Majesty at Buckingham Palace during my time as the Canadian on the nine member eminent persons group appointed by the Secretary General of the Commonwealth to prepare a report on Commonwealth reform and modernization and draft a charter for the heads of government consideration, which Her Majesty ultimately signed, I was struck by how much understanding she had of Canadian politics and the range and depth of the discussions going on between the members of the EPG from nine different countries, underlying issues relating to human rights, the promotion of democracy, the rights of small states, the economic opportunities for vast majority of Commonwealth citizens who are under 35 years of age. Her Majesty engaged with each of them with a measure of detail and focus, which was truly impressive. And when our EPG report was completed and forwarded to the heads of government for discussion and decision at the, at the um, 
Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth, Australia in 2011. Her Majesty, of course, took no formal role in the discussions. However, her opening message to delegates present at the welcoming ceremony could not have been more clear. As she completed her comments, as always, measured, warm, inspiring, and welcoming, it was clear that Her Majesty had not only read the report of the EPG, but anticipated a cordial reception of its recommendations by the heads of government there gathered. As the report had within it recommendations on gay rights, HIV AIDS assistance, and clear admonitions on the needs for change regarding the rights of women and young people and of climate change, issues not viewed in the same way by all the respective government heads from across the Commonwealth, the gentle tilt of Her Majesty's message meant a great deal. And despite no lack of controversy in the subsequent heads of government meetings, the report's recommendations were largely passed, which resulted in a new charter of the Commonwealth, which Her Majesty signed at the subsequent Commonwealth Day at Marlborough House, London, 2013. I was honored to be at Perth, and I was honored to be at Marlborough House when Her Majesty signed the document. The many accounts of her role, her role on the issue of apartheid in South Africa and the strong differences between Prime Ministers Mulroney and Thatcher need not be retold this evening. Her unique role as Britain's head of state, Canada's head of state, head of the Commonwealth, might have put another leader in what appeared to be a difficult bind. But to her credit, all available evidence underlines how her influence played a most constructive role in the positive outcome and the arrival of true democracy to our South African brothers and sisters of all races. Clearly, when released from Robben Island and en route to a truly democratic multiracial South Africa, Nelson Mandela's decision upon his arrival in London was not to go to 10 Downing Street to pay his respects, but to go to Marlborough House and pay his respects to the Commonwealth and Her Majesty as its head. That told us more than we ever had to know about how significant Her Majesty's role had been. You know, it is endemic to the politics of our age that the discourse is often about power, who has it and how is it used. The Commonwealth has no binding treaty. It is not a defense alliance like NATO or a trade alliance like the EU or the US-Canada-Mexico trade agreement. It is a voluntary intergovernmental association of countries that could not be more diverse. It encompasses now 2.6 billion people worldwide. The myriad of underpinning Commonwealth associations from professional associations, scholarship foundations, athletic and university associations, including the Commonwealth of Learning based in Vancouver, all reflect an idea that may seem unduly optimistic and naive in these troubling times. But people of goodwill from different cultures, geographies and points of view, limited, um, united rather by the uh, will of parliamentary democracies, determined to work together, can make both the prospects for their people and the world better by simply choosing to do so, respecting each other while learning from each other. Her Majesty has no political or economic power, as is appropriate for a constitutional monarchy, but her influence as a force for balance, inclusion, common higher purpose has really been the secret sauce that has made the Commonwealth the recipe for cooperation and mutual respect and work so well. Her leadership of the Commonwealth and the immense role of her influence and presence as the organization's head is of course expanded by the many roles the Duke of Edinburgh took and other members of the Royal family take and discharge as patrons or honorary heads of a myriad of Commonwealth organizations which operate worldwide from regiments 
to study organizations, youth leadership, and development organizations, professional associations that span the geography of 50 plus countries, most continents and every language and religion and culture known to humankind, a myriad of programs and networks for everything from active out of classroom technical learning based at the Commonwealth of Learning in Vancouver, special uh, activities for participants in need of intellectual development and encouragement, and of course, the protection of the public values that are so central to our way of life. I can even remember colleagues when Jacques Parizeau, the articulate and sovereignist Paxi Québécois premier in Quebec, on the eve of another Quebec referendum some many years ago, asserted that, of course, an independent Quebec would want to remain in the Commonwealth. Tells you more than you can ever, ever know about how important that organization was and how much high regard Her Majesty is held. Her leadership has been nuanced, public as required, discreet and with light touch when necessary, but always seminal to the core idea Her Majesty expressed so clearly in 1953. In a brutal world of threatening and authoritarian great powers who have nothing but disdain for the freedoms and collaborative aspects of democracies, the volunteer associations between peaceful countries and their people, the Commonwealth stands for, while not perfect, is a symbol of what people of goodwill can achieve together without the use of intimidation, threats, or military power. That the Commonwealth survive and thrive has never mattered more. Her Majesty has been and is more than the Commonwealth's never flagging champion. Her Majesty has been and remains the wind beneath its wings. Long may she continue in that role. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. A round of applause for uh, the Honorable Hugh Siegel. Fascinating presentation. One Thank that I've not heard in a long time. Your personal uh, anecdotes, your personal perspective, the political aspects, the, the royal aspects, the personal side of Her Majesty combined together in your presentation and the time that you've taken to put it together has been rewarding for our years. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's start the discussion. Uh, we have decided that if you raise your hand, we will get uh, Akash, our, uh, we will get the technical advisor, Sankarshah, to identify you and you can ask your questions. So could I have the first question, please? So while my colleagues are thinking about the question, um, Hugh, how do you envision when the time will come when there will be a change of the guard, how will that change things, keep things the same, or is there going to be any shift in movement? Or what do you anticipate that would look like? So Colin, um, let me start by saying that one of the strengths of the Commonwealth is that it has never been an organization fixed in a particular past. It has roots in the past, but it has changed dramatically as its membership has changed, as the societies within its member countries have changed, so that things that are on the Commonwealth agenda today would not have been on the Commonwealth agenda 10 or 15 years ago. And I think it's fair for us to conclude on one issue, for example, no global organization has more small island states than the Commonwealth. No group of countries world, worldwide face greater risks from climate change than those small island states in the Commonwealth. Um, if one assumes at some point in the future, um, uh, His Royal Highness will become the head of the Commonwealth. Prince Charles has had a consistent, very public engagement on environmental issues for a very long time. My sense is that that particular transition, which hopefully will not happen for many years, but when it does, will put him in a position to provide the kind of leadership to a Commonwealth which will be very much focused 
on sustaining our small island state members and putting in the, um, the investment in protective and other activities necessary for the, those countries to survive. So I am optimistic that just as the, 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 the nature of the Commonwealth changed during the many decades of Her Majesty's leadership, and she was able to adapt quite remarkably, as were the institutions of the Commonwealth, so will the Commonwealth itself change again in the future and its next uh, head will reflect that change and provide a measure of leadership, which I think will be very, very constructive. Comments, uh, Akash, uh, I, you. I see you're gonna ask the question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Colin, and thank you, Hugh. I'm really pleased to see that time has not dimmed your enthusiasm for the Queen or, or matters related to, to the Crown. I'm going to pick up on the question that Colin asked about managing change. And I'm thinking about how to frame this. So with your indulgence, I'm going to try offering you an observation before making a kind of plea to you in my question. <laughs> so in, in recent weeks, I've come to realize that Canada has quite poor public understanding of the role of our head of state in the basic architecture of our democracy. As you know, I live in Ottawa and had a chance to speak with some of the recent protesters who came to the city. And I was surprised to learn that they came here not only to honk horns, but also to deliver what they called a memorandum of understanding to the Queen. And it called for the Governor General to dismiss the democratically elected government, summon a junta from the Senate, and instruct that group to govern Canada in an extra parliamentary coalition with the truckers. I think that's insane, but they sincerely believed it was possible. And I was quite struck that thousands of people traveled thousands of kilometers to Ottawa in the dead of winter because they believe that's how our head of, head of government, our head of state and our, our system operates. So my prediction is that the Queen will probably prove to be mortal. <laughs> and when she goes, there'll be a national soul searching about the role of our head of state. I suspect that if what I saw in the protest is typical, that when we have a kind of national debate over the future of the crown, you know, do we want to retain a monarch? If so, how should the crown adapt? How should it grow? How should it Canadianize? All the kinds of things Colin was referring to. That without some kind of early intervention, that debate would happen in a context of significant public ignorance about what the crown actually is and, and does and how it operates. One that might lead at best to social divisions and at worst to, to really terrible political decisions. So this leads me to my plea to you personally. I'm quite an admirer of your work in the Commonwealth Eminent Persons Group. And I think that one of the most extraordinary things about that group is that it was struck to address fundamental questions about the Commonwealth and its functioning without waiting for a crisis to prompt those questions. So I'm going to ask you as an eminent person, if you would press Justin Trudeau and Rita Hall to call you out of retirement to lead an eminent persons group on the future of the Canadian crown so that we can have this discussion and perhaps ha have public education before the moment of crisis strikes us. Well, Akash, thank you very much for that question. And as always is the case with your questions, they're neither simple nor easy to answer, but I will do my very best. Number one, um, uh, I believe that um, there were many issues that contributed to the anger and the frustration of the truckers who, whether they blocked the border at Windsor or whether they came to Ottawa um, or blocked borders in Coots, Alberta or in, a, in, in Manitoba that really had nothing to do with the structure of government, but had a lot to do with their sense that a whole bunch of decisions were being made either by elites or by public health officers who were parts of the elite and that their day-to-day -day life and the impact on their lives was not really being taken into consideration. Um, and if you think about it, um, I have a high regard for the public health officers that I know. I think they're outstanding physicians who care deeply. And of course, you always, when you're looking at those kinds of decisions for a moment, you have to reflect on what will reduce the rate of infection and what is sustainable by the population in terms of rules, regulations, lockdowns, masking, and all the rest. 
And I don't think our public health officers got every decision correctly. I think they got most of them right, but some of them they didn't get right. And that would produce some of the frustration that um, one would have seen expressed by the many people who came to Ottawa legitimately angry and not wanting to be violent in any way, shape or form. Having said that, um, I had a similar reaction when I saw the memorandum of understanding, which was basically calling for a junta and, and, and for the governor general to exercise authority she does not have, and that the uh, monarch whom she represents, Her Majesty the Queen, does not have. Um, and that said to me that probably in terms of civics education uh, at the general level, as part of the public education system, and in terms of society as a whole, we have fallen behind. And, 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 and more, more substantially, because of the rapidity of social media and how quickly it moves, and how quickly an idea, however ill-founded, can move as quickly as a good idea can move, you get this kind of process where people get disconnected from the core reality. And sometimes our politicians, with the best of intentions, are so caught up doing what they're doing, managing a pandemic, for example, they forget that not everybody in the country understands all the intricate dynamics of how that must work. So I would argue that whether it's the kind of uh, eminent persons group that you make reference to, or whether it's something like the Glasgow Commission from Canadian history, where a group of distinguished Canadians were, were put together to determine what is done by various levels of government, what is done well, what is done badly, how can it be improved, what changes should be made, something like that has to happen. And I think it's important that it happen before the next election, quite frankly, a federal election. And um, while uh, I do not think my phone number is on the prime minister's um, hit list uh, for who he wants to appoint to whatever, I, I have a history of never having said no to a first minister who asked me to do something. And I can't imagine why that history would change. Thank you very much for that uh, interesting response, uh, uh, Hugh. Uh, it's interesting, uh, when I travel the Commonwealth, the Commonwealth is so well known in many countries of the world, uh, uh, but not so well known in Canada. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to bring in here the CEO, I would like to recognize the CEO of the Canada Commonwealth Games, Brian McPherson, who's been a great partner with the Royal Commonwealth Society. <clears throat> and he writes, an astute marketing colleague once mentioned to me, the Commonwealth is well known, but not known well. So Brian, do you want to make some comments about that within the sphere of the Commonwealth Games and and any comments thereof? Welcome, Brian. Well, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hugh Siegel, nice to see you again. Likewise, likewise. We wish the Commonwealth Games success in Birmingham this year. Thank you. Well, we're bringing a strong team. We'll show Canada proud. Good. So do you want to uh, uh, emphasize on your, your comments? Yeah, it, the person I was speaking to had some data with them and said that 86% of Canadians know the word Commonwealth, but less than 5% knew what it really meant, um, which was his way of saying there needs to be an education process put into place, as the Honorable Hugh Siegel mentioned, some sort of civics lessons in primary school and in junior high would probably be a good thing in the long run. But it gets, gets down to values, as Honorable Hugh Siegel said. Um, and those values are manifested in many ways, including within the Commonwealth sport movement and the Commonwealth Games. Uh, and we do our best to um, make Canadians aware of those Commonwealth values and the value of the Commonwealth to Canada, not just on the field of play, but off the field of play as well. It just gets frustrating sometimes 
when people don't have the same level of understanding and truth around what the Commonwealth means, and more importantly, what it does, not just in Canada, but across the globe. And uh, sometimes I lack the patience. <laughs> Well, Brian, let me let me agree with um, both the uh, thrust and uh, your conclusion. Um, and here's part of our challenge: very competitive media world in which we all operate, more competitive today than it's ever been. Um, I recall, um, I recall federal governments that launched great campaigns on national unity, great campaigns um, were launched in places like Ontario on. Uh, don't drink and drive and um, button up and belt up for safety and all that good stuff. And we have um, in Ottawa the capacity through state ceremonial and Heritage Canada to have broad information campaigns that tell people about government, about organizations which government, of which government is a part, what we do in defense, what we do in foreign aid, and the notion that there wouldn't be a chunk of that devoted to the benefits of the Commonwealth. We have a series of young people in this country who have been graduates, successful laureates of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we talking about them? We have um, a whole bunch of people who weren't Rhodes Scholars, they were Commonwealth Scholars. They got their scholarship to go to universities in Great Britain, as was the case across the Commonwealth from the Commonwealth Scholarship Foundation of which I think Princess Anne was the honorary patron. Mm -hmm. There's a million really great stories to tell, independent of the great stories associated with the Commonwealth Games and the young athletes who do so well, that, um, that we are not telling. And one of the rules when I was in the advertising business many years ago, uh, I would say to my clients, if you're not spending 15% of your gross revenues on building the brand, on making the case for why your, di your diet product or um, your airline is better than the rest, then somebody else will be spending money to reduce the value of your brand. And that's our challenge. And our challenge is to get government. And I think, by the way, this is something that many people in the private sector, particularly companies who have now a global reach across many Commonwealth countries, would want to be part of, but you need the leadership of government to get people around the table. And then I think you can see some outstanding work be developed, age specific, aimed at different generations and expressed in all of our, both our two official languages and the other languages spoken in Canada. And, and remember our First Nations who legitimately have concerns about the way their history has evolved and how fairly they've been treated when they talk about agreements that are important to them, they talk about agreements with the crown. Yeah. Because most of the treaties that are dominant in Canada today were treaties done with the crown. Which is why when Her Majesty has come to Canada, she's always had a chunk of time set aside just to meet with First Nations. Well, that's a very important part of who we are as a country and what our history, and, not enough people know about it, and we really have to make sure that they do. Well, you're speaking to the converted here, and here's my promise and pledge to you. If we're successful in host, getting awarding the hosting rights of the 2030 Commonwealth Games in Hamilton, Ontario, many of the things you talked about, many of the things that are off the field of play, the impacts, the legacies before, during, and after those games, we will manifest within the core of what we're going to be doing at those games. Wonderful. And there's no, better, you, city, no better city for that to happen in than that. Yes. 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 <laughs> Thank you very much, Brian, for that, uh, for that comment, that question. But I just want to let you know that we at the Royal Commonwealth Society were equally committed. And all those that here may be speaking to the converted, but each of us have a, has a sphere of influence. And the Commonwealth Baton is coming to Toronto, and the Royal Commonwealth Society of Toronto is taking it and doing a joint initiative with the Sea Cadets. And we are trying to inculcate a sense of 
uh, patriotism, civic responsibility, and knowledge of the Commonwealth through that the baton. So we're doing our piece. The the, uh, the Royal Commonwealth Society of Toronto, as well as of Canada, and all our colleagues, are our chapters promote the Queen's essay competition aggressively. Should it be in our schools? Absolutely. And I see that on the line is my colleague, the president of the Royal Commonwealth Society of Canada, uh, and he, uh, Peter Menneke, and he's doing some great work up in, in at, at the National. If he would like to comment about some work that's being done, I'm not sure if he's still with us. Um, if you are, Peter, you could join us. Yes, I am, but I'm sort of in the dark here. Yeah, <laughs> fantastic, Hugh. Good to see you. My goodness, that was a wonderful presentation. Oh, there's a bit of light. <laughs> Shed a bit of light. Uh, you know, there are so many things, and and these challenges, we. <laughs> It gets so frustrating all over the years. The small islands that you mentioned, as you know, Hugh, I've been involved with that from the long time from Prince Edward Island, et cetera, a very, very important role for the for the Commonwealth. But this issue of young people and and uh, the the thing that the has has been a very important contribution of certainly the Ottawa branch, but other branches as well, is the uh, National Student Commonwealth Forum, which is held every year. And it brings students from across Canada to Ottawa for about a week. And uh, the most common comment about result of that is the best experience, the best life-changing experiences and, uh, and so on. But, how long does that last? And many of them have gone into the foreign service and so on, and has, has changed changed their lives, etc. So there is work going on. We used to have a long time ago that uh, actually there was part of the curriculum that had to teach the Commonwealth, but many of the branches provided people to go into the schools and talk about the Commonwealth, but the curriculum is so packed, as you know, <laughs> that it's hard, hard to get that in. Believe me, there, you can be assured that the, the members of the Commonwealth Society in Canada are all very dedicated to this, and they are right across the world. I'm working with people right across the world right now about what we can do in terms of climate change and a whole host of things. So, there is, there is hope. Thank you, Colin, for the opportunity to say something. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Thanks for joining us. On that note, uh, we will bring the, the uh, symposium to a conclusion. And I'd like to thank once again, Hugh, for a phenomenal job. You've opened out so much in terms of what the Commonwealth is and the promise of the Commonwealth. I'm about to make this con concluding remarks, but I see that David Spence has his hand up. And just because he's a colleague of mine on council, I think I'll give him that opportunity. It's got to be a brief question and a brief comment, David, over to you. I think you've got to unmute yourself. You've got to unmute yourself. Okay, so that's not happening. So let's move right along. And our next event, Sankurt, our next event is the, Michael Volpe is going to be our speaker on the Queen, Her Majesty and Her Faith, A Guiding Light to Her Reign. This is going to be on Thursday, April the 21st at seven o'clock. Please sign in the same way you did for this event. We promise that it's going to be a great event. Uh, Michael is a renowned scholar and journalist, and he will have an interesting perspective as indeed our previous two guests. I'd like to welcome you, those of you that are in Toronto. We will be celebrating Commonwealth Day with Commonwealth Day worship with her honor, the Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell and Reverend Peter Holmes. 
at the York Baptist Church. It's an interfaith uh, church service. We have people from uh, uh, leaders from different faiths who will be coming. There will be some patriotic music, and we hope you will join us. Uh, look out, check your inbox for notices that will be coming from us. And on that note, thank you to everyone for making the time uh, to be with us. Before we conclude, I'll ask you to all please rise as we play the LOL Anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Royal Commonwealth Society of Toronto, my colleagues and members on council, we want to wish you good night and hopefully you will join us for our next event on April the 21st. Thank you. You, that was great. Thank you so much.